Marian Anderson was born in Philadelphia in February 1897 and would be the eldest of three musical Anderson sisters. The family lacked the money to give Marian lessons to nurture the innate aptitude she showed from an early age. She wore out a toy piano and violin by playing them too much. Eventually, the family got a real piano from a relative, and while she didn't have many opportunities in school, there were plenty of opportunities at her church, Union Baptist. Six-year-old Marion joined the junior choir, directed by Alexander Robinson, who was the first professional musician to recognize the child's extraordinary multi-octave range. All the Andersons went to Union Baptist, and Marion's aunt, Mary, once promoted a benefit concert by advertising her then 10-year-old niece as a true contralto. And it wasn't false advertising either. Marion's voice propelled her to a career as a child singer around South Philadelphia, on her own, with her aunt, and as a soloist in all-star choral ensembles like the People's Chorus. In January 1910, Marion's father John died from complications of a work accident. The Andersons had to move. Marion shared a house with more relatives and boarders than could fit. After her grandfather died a year later, the family began to move very often around South Philadelphia. They needed to bring in enough money for the extended family, which meant that Marion had to quit school for a time. She was likely very happy to be free from an environment that she found boring and dull, and her enormous range meant that she could fill in for any choral part, so she was able to find work doing that. But Marion's community believed that her career would be stymied if she did not continue her education. Union Baptist took up a collection, but raised only about $500 in today's money, well below what she and her family needed to invest in high school or formal musical training. The latter proved especially hard as South Philadelphia suffered from a lack of black teachers. Many of them had fled for better prospects elsewhere, and few white teachers were willing to accept black students. Many of these voice teachers taught out of the very same building. Day after day, Marion would go there and get rejected. When her search for a music education became a cause for Union Baptist, who promised to foot the bill at a local music school, she was rejected there too, explicitly for the color of her skin. Eventually, she found a good voice teacher down the street, a lady named Mary Saunders Patterson, who hosted a who's who of black musicians who came to town and who agreed to teach Anderson without pay. Together, they worked on repertoire and vocal technique, honing her voice in more of the classical repertoire, as opposed to the spirituals and Stephen Foster songs on which she'd grown up. As news of her talent and lack of educational opportunities spread throughout the community, the People's Chorus put on a benefit concert and raised about $7,500 in today's money, which went towards her education. This allowed her to move into the studio of the sought-after contralto Agnes Riefsnyder. It's a great name. And she began high school when she was 18, where she struggled to balance her budding career that helped put food on the family's table with the studies that still bored her. The pattern would later repeat with Joe Bogash, a tiny and energetic man, not much older than Anderson himself, who went by the Milanese pseudonym Giuseppe Boghetti. Her career started to go national after she met Roland Hayes, a pioneering black singer who concertized up and down the eastern seaboard. Hayes taught Anderson more than that success was possible. He showed a whole generation that dignity and persistence in the face of hardship and bigotry could pay off. He was just as home in the European canon as he was in spirituals. They sang together when the People's Chorus did Handel's Messiah, and Hayes invited her to Boston to perform Mendelssohn's Elijah with himself and Harry Burley. By the end of the year, she made her first appearance in the South. She and her accompanist, Billy King, got into a yearly pattern of touring the South in the winter and the Midwest in the spring, and they drew capacity or even record crowds wherever they went, even if the money they made and applause that they earned wasn't enough to offset the filthy and humiliating conditions of travel under Jim Crow. Her appearances across state lines introduced her to the love of her life, architect Orpheus Fisher of Wilmington, Delaware. 
Orpheus was not the only one of the Fisher siblings who was interested in Marian Anderson, but her singular focus on her career thwarted marriage plans. After several proposals, Orpheus cut his losses and married medical student Ida Gould, only to split from her after only a few years. Throughout Anderson's career, and throughout any number of other relationships that Orpheus Fisher had, he remained singularly devoted to Anderson. They had a mutual understanding that they would marry one another one day. It would take many, many years for one day to come about, but it did, as we'll see later. Anderson first had to reach the greatest heights of success available to a singer. Her growing fame and network led to her first recording sessions, which is this painful year-long process that resulted in just six Harry Burley spirituals being committed to disc, arranged through Joseph Pasternak of the Philharmonic Society, who engaged her as the first black soloist to perform with the group, and he was rewarded with a record-breaking audience. The thing is, the Philharmonic Society wasn't an A-list orchestra, so Anderson couldn't use this opportunity to launch into appearances with more prestigious ensembles. But she had another important concert coming, as an appearance at Harlem led to a date at Town Hall, understood as New York City's preeminent venue for emerging artists. The venue wasn't even half full, and the press, while enamored with the purity of her voice, critiqued her interpretation and critiqued her understanding of the variegated repertoire that she sang. For someone as reserved and as easily overwhelmed as Marian Anderson was, the Town Hall concert was a devastating watershed moment. It caused her to question everything about her career and her path. But her supporters, especially Giuseppe Boghetti, were undeterred. He entered his star student into the New York Philharmonic's contest to find soloists for their summer concerts. And Anderson beat out 300 other vocalists and appeared with a Philharmonic in August 1925. The audience was enthusiastic, and she was greeted to another thousand-strong reception when she returned to Philadelphia. While there was broad agreement in the black community about the need for civil rights and social justice, its leading thinkers had been split since Reconstruction between those who favored gradual means and those who wanted immediate action against continuing oppression. Black artists were on the front lines of these issues, and they were under special scrutiny to be exemplars of their race. Anderson largely followed in the footsteps of Roland Hayes, the two even advanced their careers, in part, by travel to Europe. This was not entirely for racial reasons. Europe had its own bigotries, after all. But it was because American musicians were rarely taken seriously without some study in Europe. London, where Hayes had sung for the royal court and where a network of black American musicians already existed, was an ideal jumping-off point. Europe may not have had Jim Crow, per se, but tensions existed, especially when Americans came over and sang the European repertoire. Anderson met with composers and performers, including the mezzo-soprano Elena Gerhardt, a German expatriate whose devotion to the art song of her culture, as opposed to the more glamorous world of opera, resonated with her own love of German leader and her own aversion to opera. Anderson felt that her duty in Europe was to get training closer to the source of the repertoire that she wanted to study. Through composer Roger Quilter, she appeared at the proms to rave reviews and received inquiries about recording contracts from several companies. She avoided the rapidly deteriorating political situation of the late Weimar Republic by touring Scandinavia. It was a bold choice on her part. American singers were almost unheard of and black American music a complete unknown in that part of the world. You might be thinking, well, this is a Great Depression. What on earth was she doing in Europe? In part, it's because she had signed with an agent who just wasn't a good fit for her. A wide swath of the American musical scene was then under the thumb of a guy named Arthur Judson. 
He managed the New York Philharmonic, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and a roster of nearly a hundred performers. His connections, although vast, were unhelpful for a black contralto. Anderson and King had been able to do more concerts, and with a better schedule, when they were doing things on their own. Judson's North American tours would have these long fallow periods, followed by concerts that were close together in time but very far apart in space. A logistical nightmare. When in America, Anderson and King had to rely on whatever Judson's people could piece together, which often managed to be enough to support Anderson and her mother, but nothing beyond that. With black colleges throughout the South, once the bedrock of her touring circuit having cut their funding for guest artists, Anderson turned to Europe, where she gave a flurry of concerts throughout Scandinavia. She grew to be such an enormous sensation that, when she wanted to perform in Denmark, their national bank refused her work permit, ostensibly because they feared that she would take too much money out of the economy at once. Again, Great Depression. The bank wouldn't relent even when the Danish people protested, signaling their rejection of even the implication of racial prejudice. Anderson gave one concert every two days on average for seven months, ending her Scandinavian barnstorming with considerable regional and growing global fame. In three recitals, she conquered Paris. Then she went on two Soviet tours, circling around Central Europe, untouchable for black artists due to the growing Nazi menace. Only Anderson's newfound clout allowed her to sing in Austria, albeit not as an official invitee of the exclusive and increasingly fascistic Salzburg Festival. It was at this festival that Toscanini said that Anderson's voice was one only heard once in a hundred years. Hey, that's the name of the show. Her long absence from the United States had done a number on her old accompanist, Billy King, who sent Anderson a series of increasingly bizarre and obsessive messages. The Finnish pianist Kosti Vahanen had taken over for King, who felt, rightly so, that his job was on the line as soon as Anderson returned to the States. The mixed-race partnership between Anderson and Vahanen was unprecedented, which King pointed out, and he was right to fear losing his position. Anderson felt that Vahanen was a more sensitive and knowledgeable accompanist, and he was also far more mentally stable to boot. By the time she returned to America on a full-time basis, Anderson dropped Judson and signed instead with Saul Hirock. A friend of Hirock's told him that he was crazy for signing Anderson, thinking her forgotten during her time in Europe, but Hirock was soon proven right. Her triumphant return to New York and Philadelphia led to an appearance at the White House, where First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt made a deep impression. When Anderson went on to win the NAACP's prestigious Spingarn Medal, it was Eleanor Roosevelt who presented it to her. Anderson's obvious talent kept the press from mentioning her new Finnish accompanist as anything more than a curiosity. Hirok leveraged Anderson's fame and used it to twist venue's arms. This especially hurt black colleges throughout the South. They'd been the backbone of Anderson's tours in the early years, but they either couldn't pay the fees that Hirok demanded, or they objected to having other artists sent their way. Hirok liked dangling Anderson not on her own, but as part of a package deal of several concerts. Sometimes the schools just wanted Anderson and nobody else, so they didn't get anybody. Hirok could not force open the myriad segregated venues across the region, which left radio as the only way for Anderson to reach most Southern audiences. By the 1938-39 season, Hirok had increased her American pace to that of her Scandinavian one. She was crossing the country and giving recitals once every two days on average. After a brutal journey from Grand Forks, North Dakota to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Anderson put her foot down and told Hurok not to be greedy. She was now as famous in her home country as she'd achieved across Northern Europe. Anderson followed in the footsteps of her predecessors, who found meaning in putting their heads down and putting in hard work towards education, self-improvement, and success. When combined with her introverted and intensely self-critical nature, Anderson rarely stood up strongly on her own behalf. She preferred to power through racial mistreatment with something closer to resigned serenity than righteous indignation. In comparison to other leading black singers like Hayes or the multi-talented Paul Robeson, Anderson preferred to show black American music alongside 
the classics of the European literature, which was itself a political statement. Constitution Hall, in the heart of Washington, D.C., is owned and operated by an organization called the Daughters of the American Revolution, or DAR for short. They have their own long storied and complicated history. Throughout the 1920s, the DAR grew increasingly reactionary and intolerant. They denied Constitution Hall to anyone they deemed ideologically unfit, whether on their enormous blacklist or not. In the early years, when the organization outsourced concert management at the venue, there was not an explicit whites-only policy. But by 1939, it was clear that segregation was the rule in Constitution Hall. So when Howard University approached the DAR about renting the hall for an Anderson concert, the response was a predictable no. The university had gotten the same response three years earlier, and they had enough time to simply book a different venue. But this time, they expected that no, and they were in for a fight. The decade had seen a number of wins for civil rights in the region, and Howard set its sights on knocking down one of the biggest sources of segregation in the city that was not mandated by statute. Howard officials published editorials in local papers castigating the DAR. The NAACP stepped in to organize a letter-writing campaign. It was an all-hands-on-deck effort to convince a private organization to bow to enormous public pressure. Everything from leveraging their tax exemption to organizing an artist boycott, but all to no avail. The DAR's board of management kept the racist policy by a vote of 39 to 1, claiming the need to adhere to local statutes that didn't actually exist. With the pressure now on Howard to find a new venue for Anderson, a last-minute plea to the school board fell through. They cited similar reasons. But this refusal ignited the teachers' union, and an attorney named Charles Edward Russell formed the Marion Anderson Citizens Committee to picket the Board of Education. They soon joined forces with the NAACP, organizing protests all across the capital. The story went national. The First Lady, likely one of the last progressive members remaining in the DAR, publicly resigned over the issue and took to her My Day column in the press to explain her reasoning. The DAR could be shamed, but they had made their bed, and the Citizens Committee hung their hopes on overturning the school board's decision, which they did, but at the steep price of barring any future appearances. That would have been one step forward, many steps back, not just for Anderson's career, but for race relations as a whole. While members of the pro-Anderson coalition ranged from okay to furious over these attached strings, the point was moot, as Superintendent Frank Ballou reversed the decision in a matter of weeks. Meanwhile, during all of this, Anderson was on the West Coast touring as usual, largely unaware of the controversy's national implications until the First Lady's resignation. And as the April 9th concert date fast approached, plans moved forward for an outdoor concert that Hirak had floated to the NAACP as a solution as early as February. Hirak wanted this to be held in a park near Constitution Hall, but the NAACP's director, Walter White, took inspiration from an early pro-Anderson op-ed that cited the significance of the nearby Lincoln Memorial. By March 21st, the location was set. Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, who had been in the pro-Anderson camp since the outset, approved the use of federal land with little more than a week to go. The National Park Service estimated that 75,000 people showed up, stretching all the way back to the Washington Monument. Anderson was frightened out of her mind, but steeled herself and delivered the most powerful, most historically important half-hour concert in American history.
The efforts of the pro-Anderson Alliance in D.C. didn't stop after the concert. The D.A.R. insisted on continuing their discriminatory practices, even after having been so thoroughly and publicly humiliated. It was only in 1942, when American attitudes shifted after having entered World War II, that the D.A.R. made an exception to their policy, and invited Anderson to sing. Now, Anderson, Hurok, and White differed on how to deal with this issue. Do you accept it as a show of goodwill, a step in the right direction, or do you leverage it to force the DAR to rescind the segregation altogether, to desegregate Constitution Hall permanently? Typically, Anderson felt that singing for segregated audiences was better than not singing at all, and that if she maintained her poise and her composure, it could be used to show white audiences the folly of the practice. In reality, this was just too idealistic. White disagreed. The imminent death of Anderson's sister's husband may have prevented her from pushing back on his desire to finally beat the DAR. This time around, the press wasn't as sympathetic to the NAACP's position, but the DAR relented in December 1942. They may have won the earlier battle, but Anderson and those on her side decisively won the war. Time and again, writing letter after letter, Anderson chose her career over marriage. The Lincoln Memorial Concert was not only a watershed for Washington, by extension the country, but for Anderson's personal life as well. It was clear after achieving such heights of celebrity that there were no other greater heights towards which she could direct herself. Orpheus Fisher, a ladies' man across the color line, remained as serious about her as a man of his womanizing reputation, who was still technically married to his long estranged first wife, could be. He could not understand Anderson's devotion to her career. He did not love being an architect in the same way that she loved singing, and he openly fantasized about her retirement. Despite their differences, their feelings for one another were real. They bought themselves a house on a huge property in western Connecticut called Mariana Farm, and in July 1943, they married. Orpheus designed and built this studio. It was Marion's dedicated rehearsal space, which now lives in the backyard of the Danbury Museum. In early 1946, doctors discovered a small cyst in her esophagus. Facing the prospect of a long recovery, with no guarantee she'd ever sing again, she powered through another year and a half of grueling schedules. An extensive sore throat cost her 20 pounds in the summer of 1947 alone. She had the cyst removed in June 1948. Her return to Scandinavia, after about a decade away, revealed an artist whose vocal power may have diminished, but whose skills at interpretation more than made up for the deficiencies brought on by her age and breakneck touring habits. Anderson may have been the focal point in one of the monumental events of the organized early civil rights movement as we know it, but she had little agency over the proceedings, and where she could insisted on a far more moderate tone on race relations that, in the post-war era, seemed especially antiquated to groups like the NAACP, which were organizing boycotts across the South to advance civil rights. And they turned to boycott and Anderson herself when she went through with a segregated concert in January 1951. Hirok believed that Anderson's quiet artistry spoke enough for itself, and he saw White as engaging in what he called militant tactics to achieve his ends. NAACP leaders bristled that Anderson bowed to Southern racist custom instead of joining in solidarity with them for change. They didn't think she needed the money, even though she probably did. Her silence threatened to destroy her reputation among the young people who looked up to her. The truth is that Anderson just wasn't an activist by nature. She was an artist, first and foremost, and fundamentally introverted. She never seemed to really get used to the spotlight. She hated being put in positions of celebrity in the public eye. But in a world where her artistry, and indeed her very existence, was an inherently political act, there was no option that she could take to diminish her spotlight. By the beginning of 1952, 
she began using her celebrity to desegregate concerts. When she sang for the first integrated concert in Miami history, they rewarded her with a huge parade. And in March 1953, she sang to an unsegregated Constitution Hall. Then on, if a segregated institution invited Anderson, she would decline. As her career matured, Anderson found herself being pulled in a number of directions. By Hurok for an autobiography, by herself to continue to fulfill her inner sense of artistry, and by Rudolf Bing at the Metropolitan Opera to play a role. Bing had set his sights on desegregating the Met a half decade earlier, and he had taken steps towards meritocratic hiring practices despite intense criticism from the board. Bing's next step in the project was to try to cast Anderson as Ulrika in Verdi's opera Un Ballo in Mascara, an important single-scene role. Bing had expressed reservations about Anderson's ability to transition from recitalist to opera singer at such a stage in her career, but it was Anderson's enormous fame and her near-universal appeal, in addition to maybe some behind-the-scenes pushing from Hurok, that convinced Bing that Anderson, then in her late 50s, was the right figure to break the Met's color line. Ulrika's part lay a little too high for Anderson, but she pressed on, earning a record-breaking fee of $1,000 per appearance starting in January 1955, to a house that sold out almost as soon as her appearance had been announced. Opera was a very different world from her usual concertizing. In some ways, it was a dream come true. In others, a reminder that her legendary voice had lost its youthful agility. Even at the height of her power, she was self-critical, concerned whenever she didn't have a vocal coach at the ready to help her whenever even the smallest of issues arose. She had been one of the world's best singers for decades, and she felt lost without a regular teacher who could guide her on her never-ending quest for artistic perfection. This even extended to languages, enunciating languages that she didn't speak, Swedish, Finnish, even Hebrew for a translated performance of Brahms' Alto Rhapsody, and she did this with such proficiency that native speakers often had an easier time understanding her than understanding actual native singers. It's unclear if Anderson blocked things out in her childhood because they were dramatic, or if she was embarrassed by them and felt that she had to present a fictionalized, perfect account of her life as a prominent champion of civil rights, or if her age genuinely distorted her memory. But as the years went on, she acknowledged neither her father's business selling liquor to make ends meet, nor her interruption from formal schooling prior to high school, starting it later than most students. When Hurok got Howard Taubman to ghostwrite Anderson's autobiography, she gave him very little to work with. She often would turn off Taubman's tape recorder before wading into controversial details. When Taubman finished his book, 
published against Anderson's wishes as My Lord, What a Morning, she pushed for it to completely excise any mention of the Lincoln Memorial incident. She's kind of like writing about Einstein and not talking about E equals MC squared. She may not have been a frontline civil rights activist, but she was a useful tool in the cultural front of the early Cold War, when the US and USSR attempted to one-up each other through sending artists to each other's countries. While Hurok believed that Anderson's usefulness in these matters was limited at best, the State Department wanted to capitalize on Anderson's Met Opera debut to counteract Soviet propaganda that relied on highlighting racial tensions and inequalities in the United States. The public-private partnership where the State Department contracted with the American National Theater and Academy sent Anderson on a whirlwind tour of East Asia from Korea to Pakistan, an incredible strain on a 60-year-old who, having never gotten used to the public eye, was now an ambassador for her country, whose every move was televised. It went further than that. Her first appearance on this tour coincided with the crisis at Little Rock High School. That put extra strain on an amateur cultural ambassador at a crucial moment in her country's racial reckoning. The world's positive reception led the Eisenhower administration to keep her on the world stage. Anderson was selected as an alternate delegate to the 13th session of the United Nations. She accepted the role only after talking it over with her friend Eleanor Roosevelt. Her sensitivity to others and her personal connections that she made in Asia gave her more perspective on how the United States was viewed across the world in a time of increasing decolonization. The U.S., in a way, used Anderson for clout on the international stage, and this backfired when Anderson, in keeping with U.S. foreign policy, moved to adjourn a motion that would have set up a special session on the fate of the Cameroons, which were then still under French and English colonial thumbs. The defeated motion saw Anderson attempt an explanation of her position, only to be excoriated by African delegates who assumed that she would be on their side. Some of these delegates had become her friends over the course of the session. There is no one in this room who is more interested in the people whose fate we are trying to determine than I, she said. I am a member of an instructed delegation. A return to the concert circuit after her stint at the UN revealed an Anderson with a declining voice. She commanded high fees for years and years, but neither her nor her husband had saved enough for her to retire and still support her mother and her two sisters. She was greeted on a long-awaited Australian tour as though she were nobility, but the Australian and Kiwi press were brutally honest about the 65-year-old's voice. Back at Mariana Farm, Orpheus had been diagnosed with diabetes, followed by a small stroke in early 1962. By 1964, she could no longer hold off the inevitable and set off on her farewell season, beginning at Constitution Hall and ending in Carnegie Hall. It was the end of an era for a legend who would reemerge only a few more times in the coming months to sing with orchestras when they were conducted by her nephew, the conductor James DePriest. Sol Hirok, crafty as ever, realized that audiences were paying to see the Marian Anderson, not necessarily to hear her sing. Her status as an icon transcended her singing career, so pieces like Aaron Copeland's A Lincoln Portrait, which requires a narrator and not a singer, were ideal for the aging icon. Health concerns of others, then finally herself, defined her later years. By her death in April 1993, at the age of 96, she had completed a gradual transition from contralto icon to genuine American legend. The story of Marian Anderson shows us just how much someone's life can be a result of their circumstances. Her gift was a boon first to her family, then her race, then her whole country. She was shy every step of the way, but she understood the path that lay before her, what she needed to do for the good of her family 
and for the cause of political and social equality everywhere. She shows us that you don't have to be on the front lines of activism to make a powerful difference. You just have to know when to recognize when your moment has arrived.